All right, section 3.1, we started last time, numeration systems, and we talked about three different <coughs> um, historically significant numeration systems. So somebody tell me one of them that you remember we talked about. Okay, I heard Mayan, Babylonian, and Egyptian. Okay, so those are the three we talked about last time, and we have one more system that we're going to talk about today. Um, this is one that we do still see in use today um, in different fashions, and that's the Roman numeration system. So let's talk about that one. All right, so this is our table that we're going to fill in, and you guys can help me fill in at least part of it because I know you know these ones. So what is the value of that first Roman numeral? That is one. So a single line, sometimes you'll see it almost look like the little capital letter I with like a, a line on the top of the I and the bottom of it. So um, it just depends on, more than anything, it depends on the, the tech, the, like the font. We'll say it that way. It more depends on the font than anything else. What about the V? That is five. An X? Ten. And that might be as far as you remember. L showed up, and, or maybe didn't. It is 50. Recently, it showed up when they did the Super Bowl and they decided not to use it, which is interesting. Does anybody think they might know what C is? It is 100. Thinking about patterns of what's happening, can you guess what D probably is? It's 500 first, and M is 1,000. Now, um, a couple of thoughts since we have now written down every num uh, numeral between these four systems that we're going to. Um, you guys get note cards on your tests, um, and if I wanted you to after you write down every single enumeration system, that would take up your whole note card. Agreed? Would not be a very good use of your note cards. So on your test, when we do get to this, and I know that's still a while away, but you will get a sheet of paper for me. And this is the ones I use, um, and, and it has all of them on there. Okay. Now, it doesn't have anything but just these tables, so it doesn't tell you how to use them or anything like that. That part, if you aren't sure or have a hard time remembering, is what you would want to write on your card, um, but you don't have to write the numerals themselves on your card. Okay. And let's talk about these Romans because they had some interesting things that they did. Now, one of the things they did looked a little bit like the Babylonians. They did repeat some symbols, so if you wanted the number three, you did three eyes, right? I mean, they, they did do that. Um, but they didn't do that all the time. So they had something called a subtraction property. So to avoid repeating a symbol more than three times, a smaller value is placed in front of a larger one. But it's only one value smaller that may appear before the larger one. In other words, you can't put any smaller numeral before a larger one. It's only the one that comes directly before it in the table. Okay. In particular, that means that this property only affects our numbers that have 4 or 9 in them. So anything that we have that's got like 40, 42, you know, it would affect the 4. Um, 39, it would affect the 9. But if you had the number 38, it, this property doesn't have anything to do it because it doesn't have 4s and 9s in it. Okay? Um, so if we wanted to write the number 90, if we wanted to write the number 90, we would actually write... Um, the numeral, what's, what's the, what is the closest numeral to 90 on this table? C, 100, right? Okay, so we would actually use this because it has a 9 in it to write 100. That's the C. And we would write a symbol before that. That means we're going to take something away. The only things that can come before a C, let me look, show you this. The only thing that can come before a C, oh my goodness is an X. Nothing else can come before a C. Okay? So you can't do IC. You can do XC, but you can't do IC. It's got to be one value less than that. And not the fives don't count. That's their system. There's no like... I mean, that is their system. Have to like only yeah. X can go before C. Yes, only the X can go before the C. That is the way that they wrote their symbols. Now, because the X is in front of the C, X is worth 10, right? And C is worth 100. So when the number comes before it is subtraction. Yes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if we wanted the number 99, it would be wonderful if we could write IC. But we can't. That is not how they would write their number 99. 
So they almost think about it as writing the number 90 plus the number 9, okay? So how do I write the number 90? It's almost like a place value separation. How do I write the number 90? Well, I just did that. It's XC. Now think about how I write the number 9. That one is IX. Okay, X is worth 10. I put 1 before it to get a 9. So anytime you see the numbers 4 or 9 involved in the problem or involved in the number, that's when you're going to see the subtraction property present in the problem. But that really only affects 4 and 9. It really only affects 4s okay. and 9s. So if it was like 37? Yeah, if it's 37, you repeat, you repeat symbols. So how do I get 30? I do 3 X's. How do I get 7? I do a 5 and 3 1's. What if it's like or 2 1's, sorry. 98? Um, 98, it would affect the 90 part of it, right? Not but not the 8 part of it. Exactly. Um, there's something else in their system that sort of um, is unique. Their system only goes up to the number 1,000, right? And they don't really have a place value system like us where, you know, a num they, can, they, don't, they can't use the I in a number lo another location. So they do have do have sort of a variation of a place value system. They do it using multiplication. So when a number is large, they have a multiplication property. So that what they do is they place a bar on top of something, and if they place a bar on top of it, it means times a thousand. It's kind of like when we put a number and then we put the comma, right? We mean the number before that was a thousands place, kind of like that. So one bar on top means times a thousand, and if you put double bars on top, it's times a million, which is a thousand times a thousand. So in other words, if we wanted to write 9,000, well, we'd write a 9 because you see a 9 present, okay? It's in the thousands place. So anything, this piece right here is going to tell us the fact that it's in the thousands place that we're going to put a bar on top of it, okay? Then we just have to figure out what we're putting a bar on top of. Well, the 9. How do I write 9? I, X, and then I put the number with a line on top of it. This is not like this, okay, Th this is not what I just did like on your watches. That's not what I did. I put a line strictly and totally above it, okay? So this is not what I'm talking about. When you put a line on top of the IX, it means times 1,000. So this is 9 times 1,000 for 9,000. Okay, that's how their process works. And we're definitely going to do an example, two examples, several examples, I don't know, to show how this works with more of them. But... That's the distinguishing factor is these nines and fours and these times thousands or times millions. All right. Just like with the other numeration systems, what we're looking at is what comes before and after. So in order to determine what comes before and after, we always look at the last place value. And the last place value here is a 10. So what comes before 10? Nine. Nine. Okay. So all the values in front of this don't change. M, C, <coughs> M. All that's the same. But instead of having an X at the end to represent 10, how do I represent 9? You do IX. Right? And then what do I do at the end? Again, this, the beginning stays the same. MCM. What do I do at the end to represent the number that comes after 10? You do an X and then an I. So does it matter where we put the 1? The I. Yeah, it matters, right? Before the 10, it's worth 9. It makes it subtraction. After the 10, it makes it like addition. So what is this value in the Hindu Arabic numeral system? So let's actually break it apart and just write down what each of them are. I'm just going to separate these out with a little bit of space. And then th when I say this, I mean the original numeral. So this was our original number. How much is a M worth? This is worth 1,000. How much is a C worth? It was worth what? 100. Sorry, I started to write down the wrong thing. 100, thank you. How much is an M worth? 1,000. We already did that. Oops. Too many zeros. There we go. 1,000. And how much is the X worth? 10. 10. Okay, so do you see anywhere in this number where a smaller number comes before a larger one? C yes, C and M. So this piece right here represents a subtraction part of my problem because the smaller is in front of the larger. So the number at the beginning, 1,000, we're totally cool with that. It is 1,000. But the part that I've highlighted in red is a subtraction. How much is going to be? 900. It's 900. And then the number at the end is the 10. So what is the total that we have right here? 
1910 or 1910. Yes. Okay, we're going to go back the other direction now. That's the a little bit trickier part of doing this. Okay, so here's the deal. We see something that's bigger than 1,000, right? We're going to have a bar on top of something. So how do we distinguish that? Well, what we do is we notice where those commas are. Whoops. <coughs> so this piece right here, we're going to start with. Ignore the fact that that's 1,492. Okay, we're just going to consider it like it's 1,492, just the part that's in blue. Can I do 1,492 with their numerals? Yeah, I have numerals big enough for that, right? I have a 1,000 numeral. How do I write a 1,000? It's an M. Okay, so my point is that if this had started out with 9,000, the situation would be different, correct? I don't have a numeral. I can't write 9 M's. I never write a symbol more than three times. So if this were a 9,000, I would have to break this up into three pieces. I would have to have a millions place, and then a thousands place, and then a, the single place at the end. But because the number at the beginning is one, and I have a numeral for one, that is I have a numeral that I don't have to write more than three times, I'm good to, to not have to work with the millions. I only have to work with this as a number all itself. Okay, so that's the thing here. So here's the number, 1492. That's Columbus, right? Columbus. Okay. So how do I write the number 1,000 in the number? Again, we're only looking at the blue part. How do I get 1,000? Uh, An M. How do I get a 400? Uh, B right. I'm going to have to do something with subtraction, correct? 400 is almost 500. 500 is the letter D. 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 So I need the letter C before the letter D because that's 100 before a 500 to give me 400. Now I have a 90. We already did 90. Y'all know how to write 90. How do I write 90? X and then C. And then how do I write 2? Two? two lines. I, I. And then this is the number 1,492, but I want it to be 1,492,000. Okay, so I draw a bar over it. Why is it not the double bar? Because double bar would be millions. This is not the, in the millions place. The place value is always the location of the last one, right? This two is in the thousands place. So this would be the, the thousands. I still need to do the 19 at the end. I haven't done that yet. How do I get 19? Well, again, how do I get the 1 in the tens place? Uh, an X. Yeah, so I'm going to do an X. And then how do I get the 9? I, X. Right? So this is 19. X, I, X at the end. Notice the X, I, X is not underneath the bar. <laughs> because that would be 21. If you have the xi at the end, then this is addition. If you have it ix, it's subtraction. It's only subtraction if the smaller is coming before the larger. Yes? But if your students think you to write ixx, why would that be wrong? To write ixx? Yeah. Um, because this right here is the number 9, and we wouldn't put the number 9 before the number 10. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we, we don't do this. It's always in decreasing order of size. And if it's not decreasing order of size, there's subtraction going on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we don't want these, right? Neither of these are what we want. Okay, a little bit of a change of directions. Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about base 10 blocks. I meant to bring my base 10 blocks, but the visuals I can draw are almost as good as actually having them. I'll try and remember to bring them next time. Um, so that you can see them. But base 10 blocks are manipulatives you can use in a classroom to describe differences in place value. Um, this is one concrete um, example. Money is another good concrete example. You know, think about pennies, dimes, and dollar bills. They work very well as well. Um, but this one allows you to sort of three-dimensionalize it, and money doesn't work much bigger than a, than, you know, a one. So um, you can get to tens and stuff like that, but it, it becomes kind of 
complicated if children are not very familiar with how money works. So let's take a look then at manipulatives for these. So a unit looks like a tiny little box. Okay, that's a unit. It's worth one. A long looks like a whole bunch of these stuck together. And it's worth 10 in our base 10 system. So imagine Legos and sticking 10 Legos together. And it would make a long. Okay? If you could three-dimensionalize a long, it turns into a flat. So this is 10 units wide and 10 units long. So how big is it? It's worth 100. And then the block three-dimensionalizes that. We'll see how well I can draw this. Yes, I did not draw it extremely well. Pretend with me for a moment that this is perfect. It's definitely not. Y'all can pretend you have good imaginations, right? I can't even get it to... All right, there we go. That's a straight line at the back, by definition, because I said so, right? Okay, this is a block, um, so it's a 10 by 10 by 10, so this is the number... A thousand. All right, so these are ways to think about um, <coughs> our number system. We actually just talked about it in terms of base 10, okay? So in base 10, there are, the long is worth 10, and then the flat is worth 10 by 10, and the, the um, block is worth 10 by 10 by 10. But if you had base 8 instead, it wouldn't be worth 10. How much would a unit be worth? Well, a unit's always worth 1. What do you think a long would be worth in base 8? Eight. What do you think a flat would be worth? 64. It's 64, yeah. It's actually 8 times 8 for 64. And what do you think a block would be worth? It is, yeah. 8 cubed, which is 512. So these blocks done this way, the blocks, the units, the flats, the longs, all of that, allow us to three-dimensionalize or, or have something sort of concrete, tactile, right? You've got tactile learners. You guys know that you're going to have some of those, right? That they can actually see how you put these things together. And it starts to make sense then if you have the number 27, why you can't combine the 2 and the 7, right? They're different sizes. The 2 there is these long pieces. The 7 is these tiny little blocky pieces. I can't combine those. I can't count them as though I'm counting objects because the objects are different sizes. Um, and so there's that nice kind of a feature. It says considering manipulatives, that's the manipulatives we just talked about, how many units would 2, 3, 7, base 8 be? Now, the first thing I'd like for you to notice is that I did not say 237 because the 2 in that place is not in the hundreds place. It's in the 64th place. So when I read a number in another base, I can't use the words hundreds and thousands, I, or even like thirteens. I can't use those that language. The best that I can do is read the digits as though they were numerals. Two, three, seven, base eight. That doesn't mean I'm not going to slip up and accidentally say it wrong. I'm going to do my best. But I really can't say 237 because there aren't any hundreds. So if you take a look at this, if a number two is right here, this is in the third place over. It is actually in the 8 squared or 64th place. The 3 here is in the 8th place, and then the 7 is in the 1's place. How can you tell that? Because it's in the right order. Just like in ours, it's the 1's place, the 10's place, the 100's place. It's the 1's place, the 8's place, the 8 squared. It's going to be but 8 if I look at that, I'm going to go, it's in the 1, the 8, and the 64th. No, I, why didn't it start with why don't we write 3, 2, 1 and call it 3, 1s, 2, 10s, and 100? Our biggest value is always on the left. Okay. Well, I'm just confused. Like, why aren't we starting with the 1? Uh, read, read, this, read this number in our system for me. 237. Right? It's not 732. Okay. Because that's what you're asking me. Okay. The biggest value is always on the left. Biggest value is always on the left. Okay? So it's the same true, and no matter what numeration system, and it, we did it in all the other numeration systems as well, didn't we? 
the biggest value always came first. We just did it with the Romans. We did it with the Babylonians last week. We did it, or last time, we did it with the Egyptians. The biggest value always comes first in any numeration system. Okay. No, they were at different times. Mm-hmm. Were they, did we learn the order that they came? I think so. I think that's true. The ones that, I, Egyptians definitely are first and Romans are definitely last. The Babylonians and the Mayans, I'm not sure in the middle. That's why I'm trying to decide. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but I think so. Yeah, I think so. Okay, let's finish this one. Um, with what this would be then. So imagine then that somebody came in with my crayons. We talked about the crayons last time, right? And they came in and they had two bags of crayons that each had 64 in them. How many crayons would that be? Okay, and so how did you get 128? I did 64 times the number in that place. Okay, so what Amy just did is she did two times 64. Two bags of 64 crayons. And then we have some bags that have eight crayons per bag. There's three bags of those. Yeah, so that's three times eight. That's another, whoops, 24 crayons, right? And then we have some stragglers that weren't enough to make a full bag. In fact, there were seven of them. So there's seven sort of leftovers. And the question is, how many total would I have? You could also think about this in terms of the Legos, right? If you had 64 Legos all stuck together nice and neat, and you had two sets of those, and then you had three sets of eight all stuck together, longs, right? And you had these seven, and you, then you broke them all apart into their separate units, their separate pieces. The question is, how many Legos would you have, okay? So if we add up 2 times 64 plus 3 times 8 plus 7, what do we get? 159. And I, I can't say that because that's actually our numeral. 159 individual units is what that would make up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just hold tight for a second. Okay, so the question B above is equivalent to asking what is 237 base 8 if it's written inside of base 10? Okay, so that's what this is. So in base 10, there, there's 159 of these Legos or crayons or whatever picture you want to have in your mind. Um, and we could break them apart into these sort of groupings that have all powers of 8. Okay, and if we had them grouped in powers of 8, that number looks like 237. If we had grouped them into powers of 10, it looks like 159. Okay, so this is like now having 100, one bag of 100 and five bags of 10 and nine leftovers. That's what it's like. So we're going to take a look at three different base systems. We're going to talk about base 3, base, what did I say, 7, and base 12. Okay, so in base 3, we have three numerals, just like in base 10, we have 10 numerals. So we talked about this last time as well. In base 10, we have the numerals from 0 up to what? 9. nine. nine. 0 up to 9. So what do you think my numerals are in base 3? 0 what? <coughs> 0 up to 2, yes. 0, 1. My pen is not writing very well today. And 2. These are my numerals in base 3. Notice there are no 3s in base 3. There's no single numeral of 10 in base 10, right? There's not. It's a two-digit number. It's two numerals that we call 10. There is no 10 as a digit in base 10. So there's no 3 in base 3 either. So what do we do in our system when we run out of digits? What happens when you hit 9? What do you do? <coughs> You put them together. You, you make two-digit numbers, right? The same thing happens in any numeration system. Okay, so if we're working in base 2, we're working in base 8, we're working in base 15, well, we just change it to have two digits instead of one digit. 
So what is the smallest two-digit number in base 10? One and then a zero. It's a 10, right? That, that's it. Well, the smallest base our smallest two-digit number in base three is also one zero. You ran out of place values. You ran out of digits, so you have to go to a two-digit number. And the smallest two-digit number is going to have a zero in the ones place and a one in the whatever other place you've got. In this case, the threes place. What do you think would come after one zero? One one. What would come after one one? One two. Any idea what comes after one, two? Two, zero. two, zero, because I'm out of place value. I can't increase the two any further because there aren't any more digits to use. After two, zero would be two, one, and then two, two. And then what would I have to do? A three-digit number. What would the smallest three-digit number be? One, zero, zero. Okay. We could keep going like this in their system. So would it be 101 or 111? One, one. After this, 101. One zero one. One zero one. Mm -hmm. It would. And then 102. Yep. And then 110. One one one. Right. Yeah. All right, base 7. Change gears. What do you think is this, uh, what do you think are the digits in base 7? Zero, zero. zero through 6. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Six, what's going to come after six? Uh, zero. One zero. And then one one all the way up to what? One six. One six. One six. And then it's going to become two zero and we're going to keep going. What would the biggest two digit number be in base seven? Six six. Six six. And after six six we would get one zero zero. Base twelve is different. Why is base 12 somehow very different than base two, 3 and base 7? Because it has two Yeah, I mean, like, it's bigger than the base system we normally work in, right? All the other ones were smaller. We can sort of leave numbers out and, and make them smaller, but what do we do when we need, like, extra numbers? Well, here's what we do. We're going to have 0 up to 9. Depends on the resource that you use. Some books will go to letters and use the letter A. Okay? A, B, C, and so forth. That's my favorite. But your book doesn't do that, and we're going to stick with what your book does so that we make sure that it you know, matches. What your book does is it uses T for 10. So the number 10 is T. It uses E for 11. If you needed a 12, there's no 12 in base 12, but if you had a bigger number system, it does use a W for 12, just so you know. Um, but T and E, we get extra numerals. That's what we have, extra numerals. So you said T is for 10 and E is for what? 11. Mm hmm for 11. So this equals 10 and equals 11 means in our minds, it's the value, it's the single digits, it's not their number. Okay, their number is T, their number is E. Okay, what do you think comes after E? One zero. One zero. And we'll keep going all the way up until we hit one nine. And what do you think comes after one nine? One T. One T, and then one E, and then two zero. And we could keep going. What is the biggest two digit number in base 12? E, E. I just wanted you to remember what in the world it was representing. No, 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 no. Like we wrote 9T E 10. Like. Because that's not 10, that's 1 0. That's 1. Is 10. Mm -hmm. This oh, right here, this right here, where was it? I'm sorry. Where am I? Here. This right here is the number 1 in the 12's place. Okay. And a 0 in the 1's place. Okay. Well, then why do we have T? Okay. So we haven't been using them before. If it, if it bothers you, just erase them, Hannah. Well, like, okay. but I don't understand what the purpose of T and E are. Because this is saying that my, my long, my Legos that are all stuck together, there's 10 of them in that. Okay. There's 11 of them in that. There's 12 of them in along. So in base 12, there are 12 
Legos stuck together in a long. Okay. Our, our flat is a 12 by 12 flat instead of being a 10 by 10 flat. Okay, let's take a look. What we're wanting to do is much like we did with the actual historical numeration systems on this problem. We're wanting to find the number before and the number after the given digits. Okay? <coughs> These are constructed almost always from your book and from me in such a way that one of them is easy and the other one is tricky. Okay? If I wanted them to both be easy, then it would just look like our numeration system anyway. The point is to get you to think because as a child, it doesn't always make sense when we talk to a child and say, what comes before 19? And they're like, 18, no problem. What comes after 19? And they're like, well, what's after 9? Well, after 9 is a 10, so do I say 10 teen? I mean, like, do you see what I'm saying? So this is why we're doing this is because it puts you in a similar position as your students. You've been doing this kind of math in base 10 for a long time. It's easy. I mean, addition and subtraction, counting. You guys know how to do it because you've been doing it for years. The kids you work with, they don't. And some of them catch on very quickly and some of them don't. Okay, so you're trying, what we're trying to do is to put ourselves in a position of where it's a struggle to think about it a little bit again. That, that's really the goal of this exercise, okay? Some of you are like, I don't want to think, that's my point. <laughs> okay, so this one, the easy one is the number before. What's the number before 1, 4, base 5? One, 1, 3. Okay, so the number that is before this one, oops, is 1, 3, and you do need to write the subscript 5. So if we were sort of writing them in order, it would go 1, 3, base 5, and then it would go 1, 4, base 5, and then we cannot write 1, 5, base 5. Why? There is no 5 in base 5. I've run out. So what would come next? 2, 0. It's equivalent to when we hit 19 in our base system. I've run out of singles. I can't add another 1 to the 9 and actually stay in a two-digit you know, situation where the first number didn't change, right? I mean, I can't do that. I've run out of numerals. All right, T00 base 12. T00 base 12. That's my middle number, if you will. The easier one on this one is the one that comes after it. What comes after T00? T01. We just add one more on the end. No problem. Adding one is easy. Adding one to zero is always one. It doesn't matter what number system you're in. That has to work. But when you take one away from zero in any number system, that's tricky, right? Think about the number 300 and you take away one. It affects every single part of the problem before, doesn't it? Every single digit in that number changes. So your expectation as we do this problem is that I'm not gonna have a T, a zero, or a one, or a zero. I'm not gonna have any of these numbers the same when I do the number before it. Yes? What is the number T, zero, zero? What does that represent? Yeah, so this is the place values, remember. So I have, this is the ones place, this is the twelves place, and this is the twelve squares place. Okay, so I've got these flats, right, that are all 12 by 12s. And I've got T of them. What is the number T? It's 10. I'll write it in words, actually, instead of writing numerals out since we're using numbers everywhere else. This is like having 10 flats. Okay, so I have 10 of these flat pieces of, um, you know, of blocks, and then I have none, none others. But I have to break apart one of these flats. I'm mean, like, physically what I would have to do is I'd have to take one of these flats and I'd have to break it all into pieces in order to take one away. I mean, you can't just take one off the little corner and now it's not a full square, right? You can't do that. So if I take one of the 10 flats away, how many 10 flats are going to be left? Nine. There's gonna be nine left. I had 10 flats, now I'm only going to have 9 flats. Okay, so I took one of the flats away and I broke off a little corner. I don't really want to break it all apart. I still want to have longs that are left. How many longs would I have left? More. More. It, it would be E. 
it would be E. You'd have 11. Okay, so what does your flats look like? Well, they're 12 strips of 12. So it's like having, I don't have space on here, so let me write it up here. We've taken one of these blocks They're not equally measured, but there are 12 strips here, right? And I need to break this apart and take off a little corner. Okay, so this is the image I have because I've taken one away. How many full strips do I still have? 11. I have 11 full long strips. And then this piece right here, how many is? It's not a long. How many is it? It's also 11 because it was originally 12. So it's 9 EE. -E. And I mean, physically, could you do this with blocks in our base system? Well, of course you could. You just break them all off on the corners, right? You can do this picture with any base system. There's nothing special about doing it with ours or this awkward 12 that you're not comfortable with. But it puts you in that same position as your students. So what we're going to actually talk about now is converting between those base systems. We will do the first one today and then we'll pick up here on the next one next time. Converting base blank into base 10. So this is any other base into our numeration system. That's what we were actually doing over here with the 237. We took something in base 8 and we turned it into base 10. We took all the Legos and we broke them apart into all their tiny little components. We take all the crowns and we dump them on the ground. That's what we're doing. So this operation ends up making things be multiplied. The key word here is that you multiply when you turn them into base 10. So you put the numbers in expanded form. That's what we did over here with that 237. We wrote 2 times 64, 3 times 8, and then 7 times 1. That's expanded form. And then you multiply them out. So in this system, this is base 2, okay? Does anybody know where base 2 is used in for real life, not just me using it as a funny example in a math class? It's actually for real used. You guys don't know? It's computer programming. It's called binary. Um, it's used in, in programming computers. So this is an actual computer science kind of thing, okay? All right, so the one zero zero, these all have to be powers of two. We always start on the far right with the two to the zero, which is one. So this is equal to one. This is two to the first power, which is equal to two. This one is two squared, which is equal to four. And then this one is two cubed, which is equal to eight. You don't have to write out on every problem you do like this where you write the power and then the multiplied out version. Either version of that's fine. So if you want to write down that this is 1, 2, 4, 8, or if you want to write down that this is 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, either of those are fine. But what you're going to do is you're going to take 1 times 8 plus 0 times 4 plus 0 times 2 plus 1 times 1, and you're going to multiply them. This is expanded form. If you multiply 8 times 1, you get 8. And if you multiply the 1 times 1 at the end, you get 1. So what is the total for this? It's 9. And it was a four-digit number in base 2. And it's a single-digit number in base 10. OK? I will do the next one next time, but let me make one comment for you. If the numbers, if the base goes up, like this was base 2 up to base 10, the number of numerals goes down. So on this next problem, I'm going to take base 12. That's a bigger numeral system, right? 12, and I'm going to turn it into base 10. What do you think is going to happen to my digit? It's going to look like a smaller number than T00. The number is going to look smaller when we do it.